You need to embrace capitalism. It is this hope which is the lever of progress. My favorite Fed. To keep one's reactions warm and true. They attack us because we're over there. Is to have found the secret of perpetual youth. Man, you're too pretty to be a libertarian. And perpetual youth is is salvation. All right. And uh, so I'm in an apartment here in Phoenix, and my neighbors above me earlier were doing some hammering that was quite loud. And I'm hopeful that that's uh, all wrapped up. But stop the hammering! Yeah, <laughs> if it happens, we'll uh, roll with the punches, I suppose. It's all good. We've got uh, what we've got going on. I don't know. We just have people working in here. Sometimes the oven goes off. That beeper is obnoxious, but we'll be good either way. Cool. It spices things up you know right well, cool man we're we're rolling so just like to keep it casual so we can get on into stuff but we met in person right i think we first got acquainted in a big block boom last year and then we uh ran into each other in miami again i think yeah that's right miami was wild man that was like a barrage Dude, was... of people and everything well it was technically literally a stadium of people as well. So yeah, yes, accurate. I don't think my brain had fully come to terms with like 12,000 people at a Bitcoin conference and what that meant because we kind of had that gap from like Bitcoin 2019, where I think there were 2000 some, and then you jump to 12,000 and it's like the attendees at these things are going parabolic, like the price. Yeah. It seems like people that you actually saw really was kind of like it, it funneled out to like the 2000 that mattered though, out of like the 15, because it was 15 yep. in total that people, people that just like went to Miami. So I heard. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I'm glad that we uh, got to see each other in person there again. Yeah. Yeah. Good times. Yeah. It was crazy. I think my, my favorite night was definitely the beefsteak. Uh, Same. That's that was the first the night. Fun. Yeah. I like, I went straight there from the airport. <laughs> it's like Uber, take yeah. me to my beefsteak. Take me to the meats. <laughs> oh. pretty much yeah that's funny well cool dude uh i didn't go 2019 but i bought a ticket for 2022 so are you going to bit block boom this year again i will be a bit block boom for sure and yeah. i haven't bought my bitcoin 2022 ticket yet but i am definitely planning to attend Ooh, they're going up <laughs> i know yeah fomo kicking in right yeah if anything it's it sir like a ticket to that thing serves as a like a derivative to Bitcoin as well. So if you can't end up going, yeah. someone's going to buy it from you anyway. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's funny. Like the week after Bitcoin 2019, there was a promo where it's like, if you bought your ticket right away, then it was $20.20. Um, and via, so I paid 20 bucks via Lightning for my ticket. And it ended up being a very good store of value. Those things went up nicely over those I, two I years. bet it was. <laughs> yeah, I think total everything was like a few hundred when i bought them so that was like early 2020 but uh but yeah you just can't think about like how many sets that was at that time though or else you start to cry but exactly yeah you, it's all it, worth that's it. a dangerous game to play it is yeah it really doesn't matter when you have like your cold storage on a cold card or anything and you just buy bitcoin when you need to use it uh right. so like I, I just love that handoff and any fud that gets you know thrown at you is like it doesn't really matter because like it's still there as a tool like when you need it like despite how many sats and what the price is because like you're just in like a sad way you're looking at it as a, a fiat tool or a way to like work around the fiat system uh by using the fiat system but it, it's kind of like to me how i think of tether like tether unfucked fiat in a way because they were just like sick of like dealing with banks so they made their better version of fiat and they made yep. it work and so that's pretty cool how like hodlers can look at Bitcoin and just utilize the sort of value property and medium of exchange. And for some yeah. unit of account, because like when you price your like your net worth in Bitcoin, <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> you, you start to your self-esteem start to scale up quite a bit. <laughs> For sure, man. Yeah, that's the uh, that's the progression. Right. And I feel like that is the pinnacle unit of account. When you reach that status, total paradigm shift 
game changer in terms of how you view the world costs and you know your wealth and all of that and i do think it's very much a phased progression thing so it's like you know things become money as like collectible and then store of value and then medium of exchange and then unit of account and certainly yeah. there are exceptions out there like I think people at Porkfest have been trying the unit of account thing with Bitcoin for years now, more power to them, you know, but, uh, but it's certainly not as good for that stuff today as it will be once trillions of bucks worth of value have flowed into this asset, which is kind of the store of value use case, right? Yeah. So it's like the more badass store of value it proves to be, the more people will want it makes it better as a medium of exchange. And then once enough people want it and just conceptualize value in it, then it's like, Hey, unit of account right there. And because it's technology, it's going to grow exponentially as people like Jeff Booth and others describe. And it's, it's really cool how fast the medium of exchange thing is happening, especially like having it be legal tender in countries like El Salvador and whatever, but it's, it, you know, it's right around the corner that people are going to start looking at it as a unit of account as well. So we're yeah. just like at the very beginning phase of, oh, I can use this as money itself. But then, you know, you get to use it as like, oh, well, money is supposed to like store my value and I can base everything off of that as well. Totally. I think it's really interesting to think about that, too, with um, like store value and medium of exchange. And there's also been this slightly unfortunate division, I think, in the community a little bit with some people who are more on the spend side and the like peer-to-peer -peer cash side. Yeah, and circular then some economy that are like, kind of thing. Yeah, circular economy crowd. And it almost feels like it's a, it's a versus, it's like them versus the like hodl number go up crowd. And yeah. I understand where both sides are coming from, but I actually feel like they just both benefit each other more than they realize. And there's not really as much of a division there, um, you know, as there seems to be on the surface. But, um, but I think Bitcoin's the best savings technology by far Absolutely. in the universe that we have access to. And so like hodling Bitcoin is always good for Bitcoiners, always good for Bitcoin. And then I think under the right circumstances, spending Bitcoin today can be the right thing, but that gets a little bit more nuanced for me. Like I used to work in San Francisco back in, uh, well, I worked there for a while, but I, I was like into Bitcoin there in like 2014 and 15. And I remember I was so obsessed with like merchant adoption that I was yeah. just going around trying to find these businesses that would accept Bitcoin as payment. And I would like- Were you a, a Roger Ver disciple? Kind of, yeah. I had that like Roger Ver energy <laughs> to me. Um, and funny enough, he's like one of the guys who was very influential in getting me into Bitcoin initially. So ironic yeah. how that stuff plays out, him and Eric Voorhees. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I just remember stomping around SF asking these merchants like, hey, you know, why don't you take Bitcoin? Can I pay for this in Bitcoin? And now when I look back and I kind of tally up okay, you know, I paid my doctor bills in Bitcoin and like sushi lunches in Bitcoin and all this miscellaneous stuff and even coffees. And now it's like, damn, that was a $4,000 coffee by today's prices. And like, right. you know, and so I think that drove home for me, the, the value of just, you know, the, the store of value use case. And yeah. it's like, if you are going to spend, be sure that you backfill um, but if it comes down to it, just like be thoughtful about how you deploy your stats in the world. Yeah. Really grounds you, makes you think about the future, low time preference. And I, I just hope that coffee was the tastiest coffee you had. <laughs> right. And the other thing I've kind of arrived at is I don't want to spend to someone unless they're a Bitcoiner and unless they're going to hodl ideally. Yeah. Like I don't want the value I create in the world to flow back into the fiat system and the fiat mm -hmm. regime. And when I look back at where I was during those years, I wasn't thinking about that a bit. I was just kind of like, oh, you're using BitPay and you're immediately converting my Bitcoin into US dollars and you don't actually like care about this Bitcoin stuff. You just kind of want to sell me a cocktail or a coffee. Then, you know, I still used it and that doesn't feel as philosophically fulfilling, right? If you're just like having them auto convert to fiat. Yeah, it's really cool to see last summer Last summer, about a year ago, I went to the studio and made my my ETF song, and I paid my buddy just like a fraction of his uh what he charged in in Bitcoin, and he still hung on to it. Granted, it's still in Cash App, but when I was there last week, 
he still had it there and I had him set up like a uh, blue wallet and moon wallet and I paid him like again and it's kind of cool and it was you know hovering like 10 grand during the summer or something and he was able to see like oh yeah Phil was right don't sell this thing <laughs> because like now it's uh, more than doubled so yeah. it's it's cool it, it's going to be a journey for everyone but uh, I was I guess proud of him for not caving not that he had that personality but it's just you know the whole graduate then suddenly bs but it it works but some people yeah, are man. just going to come to it th- in their own way satisfying to see for sure the and the you know number go up is a hell of a drug and i think uh, when people acquire their first sats and they just see it rise in value even if it's a small amount of sats relative to you know for them then uh it's still just something psychologically about that really pulls them in more so than any amount of nudging from a friend can, I think in some cases. Absolutely. So I listened to some of the podcasts you've been on in the past, and I just wanted to do like a brief kind of background because you kind of came from it at the, uh, the, the tech side. I knew that you were big in that. I mean, being in SF and everything. So I just, you know, quick kind of background, like what made Bitcoin kind of pop for you. But I also know that you're doing more like VC stuff. And I kind of wanted to make this conversation like a fundamental, like one-on-one on venture capitalism and just, you know, like the, like the main principles, understanding like how it works, working around it um, and where Bitcoin kind of falls with that now and how Bitcoin may sort of change that. Yeah, dude. Happy to. Uh, all that you just mentioned is some of my favorite stuff to chat about. V- the VC world, Bitcoin world, and uh, and then yeah, sort of my my you know journey too. Happy to describe that. Um, I did come at things from the tech side. So um, in college, studied computer science. I was always really into internet tech from a young age, or computer tech from a young age, uh, and so kind of knew I wanted to go on that path and started you, my career. Like- both a hardware and software guy like were you building computers and also learning like development as well and coding or how how did you come at it like what kind of really pulled you into it I was definitely more on the software side but I appreciated the hardware element like I was very much you know assembling my own computers in high school just like buying the components and like stitching stuff together um, and all that I never really got into hardware engineering per se like at the circuitry level or anything but yeah. um, but have a big appreciation for the foundational elements of like how mm-hmm. that layer beneath the software operates. Right. And then, uh, and then in terms of career focus, it was very much on the software side. Um, the first few years of my career, I was at eBay. Um, so that was kind of my foot in the door in Silicon Valley. And I was figuring out how big websites worked at large scale there. Um, it was my first exposure to that scene and worked with some wonderful people, learned a ton of stuff. I was primarily doing Linux systems engineering focused on their backend systems. So they're like databases and yeah. basically uh, thousands of servers that need to be online 24 seven doing what they're supposed to be doing. So that so was, was that like all like bash, like terminal stuff or uh, did, did you learn like both uh front end and back end programming like would you call yourself a programmer or what was your kind of day-to-day stuff i wouldn't say i would not describe myself as a software engineer per se um a lot of what i did there in terms of linux engineering was um yeah i was like bash scripting it was some python development but all of that Mm -hmm. development was very like systems and infrastructure oriented yeah exactly devopsy so like sre site reliability engineering and devops was very much the niche that i ended up in um i you know i did some object oriented c sharp stuff in my curriculum in school but i've never been a contributor to like any big modular sort of like never written libraries that are imported into other projects, never right. done software at that level. Um, it's more procedural stuff to accomplish infrastructure tasks or to automate yeah, yeah. the management of a bunch of systems. So uh, that's kind of where I started. Eventually I realized that, you know, I love the engineering side, but I really like the intersection of people and tech. And so I wanted to get into like management and leading teams and got the opportunity to do that to a small extent at eBay. And then 
I joined a couple small startups um, after that. So I was part of a cloud computing startup for about four years in San Francisco called Cloud Scaling. And we were a pretty small shop. I think it was like 15 employees when I joined and right. um, I got to like hire and grow a team of engineers and, you know, interact with the, the board and our investors. And so I'm very grateful for that experience because I felt like it was just a hell of a boot camp on not only technology, yeah. but like all aspects of what it takes to make a business go. Yeah. And, and, so and that at was some rad. point you were kind of coming out like, you know, you don't know what you don't know. So it was like a lot of like learning on the job. I, I would 100%. imagine. Oh yeah. And there's like, I remember the feeling of uh, gravity to it. The first time that I was just tasked with this engineering thing I had never done before. It was like, you know, network engineering, like make the, all these routers, like do the right thing. Um, yeah. And, and uh, you know, at the time my network chops were okay, but like, I'd never done like BGP and all these like dynamic routing protocols. And there was not really anyone to escalate to. And I just remember the feeling of like sitting in a data center with all this metal and it was very humbling. I was like, I have to make this stack of metal do stuff. And yeah. it's not like, you know, I'm the entry level person and I go over and I tap the senior person on the shoulder. Like, sure, there were some people at the company who could who could kind of help. But in practice, it was just like, you got to figure this stuff out. And yeah. it's a small shop and everybody's like got a lot on their plate. And so um it, uh, it gave me a big respect for people who just kind of get stuff done and, um, and you know, the, the harsh reality of tech and bits and metal. <laughs> yeah. What were, were your go-to resources other than Google? Like, were you like on, on Reddit or you, where were you finding the answers to these problems? Oh, man. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Google's often the starting point. Uh, Stack Overflow is kind of where yeah, you end up at uh, usually as a result of, as a result of Google. Um, so that kind of stuff was gold. And uh, I'm trying to think if there were others. Yeah. Like, you know, random, like back and forth on various kind of support forums or like miscellaneous Linux engineering forums would be where I would end up finding good resources. Um, there's also a funny story. It's a little bit of a tangent, but it fits in nicely yeah, go to, for it. to uh, so during those years, I, I joined that company in 2012, like very early 2012. And I had never heard of Bitcoin at that point, but um, it's funny to look back on because I guess just as I was joining, that company was deploying a pretty big network of servers for uh, over in Korea. And one thing that we would kind of standardly do is when we build like a cloud computing network for some client, we want to make sure that there are no hardware issues just like right out the gate. And so we do a process called burn-in, which is where you basically run some kind of application that is just meant to like stress the hell out of the hardware. Um, you right, know, red make sure there's no problems with like the CPU, disk, uh, the RAM, all that. And, and so, uh, one of the engineers was looking around and they're like, all right, well, you know, we need to like get this thing shipped to them. Uh, I suppose we could write our own burning application, but is there any other app out on the internet that'll just like, you know, use the hell out of like CPU and memory on a system. <laughs> and somebody's like, oh, what's this Bitcoin thing? <laughs> and, yeah. And so we had, uh, you know, I wasn't like directly involved in this. So I kind of like heard it from the engineer secondhand after I joined, but they had like racks and racks of gear in like very early, actually like late 2011 for them mining Bitcoin for like wow. an extent, just like 24 seven for over two weeks. And we kind of did some back of the napkin math at one point and we're like, damn, that was probably a lot of Bitcoin and they just rebooted <laughs> them and like lost the private keys are gone forever. Um, oh, so shit. those Bitcoins were sacrificed to, uh, to the community. <laughs> but, well, well, uh, well, thank you for your donation to the rest of the I network. know, right? Thanks cloud scaling incorporated for <laughs> to, to, <laughs> donating to the hodlers. Oh, um, dude. So, so anyway, yeah, that, that's a bit of a tangent, but um, learned a lot at cloud scaling, got to manage people, um, that's also the years during which I discovered Bitcoin after that. So around 2013 and started going to the Bitcoin meetups around San Francisco and learned a ton of stuff there. Um, and during you buy your first Bitcoin? Late 2013. Um, okay. and I think that's when things were starting to get kind of spicy with Mt. Gox. And yeah. like, I remember, uh, I think I remember like shortly after I bought 
my first one or like, you know, my first fraction of a Bitcoin stacked my first sats. Then the price tanked like uh, a week or two after. And I just remember being, you know, at the time I was annoyed. I was like, okay, did I just get scammed? Is this a whole yeah. like, you know, whatever, am I an idiot? But in hindsight now I'm grateful because I feel like that was uh, an early test of faith. Like it really spurred me to go and look deeper into this thing and be like, all right, is, is there substance to this or am I missing something? And I got to kind of experience that right out the gate, as opposed to, you know, having to, to wait and go through that trial by fire a little bit later. Yeah. You, you can't really have any regrets on your, your Bitcoin path because you have to learn one way or the other. So for sure. Yeah, for sure. It's easy to obsess over the sats that got away, but um, yeah, you know, that's that just that not, away. that leads to a dark place. So it's a love song right there. That's right. That's or right. Yeah. Hearted love song. <laughs> your, uh, your band's got to, got to write that one, man. <laughs> do you, right. Oh, that's a good one. That's a good idea. Uh, okay, cool. So what, when did, what, when did you kind of like leave the whole uh, startup life? So after cloud scaling, um, yeah, so found Bitcoin 2013, cloud scaling got acquired by another company, but it was kind of an aqua hire. So like nobody made a ton of money or anything. I was burnt yeah. out. So I just took some time off and like traveled the world and backpacked for six months. Where'd and then, go? oh man, all around, I did uh, 12 countries. I kind of hopped around like Southeast Asia, um, uh, India. I took like trains around India. Um, a little bit of the Middle East and like Dubai and Oman. Um, I went up Kilimanjaro in Tanzania and, and then I hung out in Istanbul for quite a bit and liked it a lot over there. So it was a good little, good little journey. Yeah. What was your biggest takeaway? i seen all those places, just the diversity <sighs> of everything and Dude. Yeah. It was gratitude. like the full spectrum of, uh, yeah, yeah. Gratitude. I mean, a whole range of, you know, emotions, memories and, um, takeaways for me. I think I was exposed, like I had fantastic experiences where I, my eyes were really open to like the good of humanity. And then I had some stuff that was like, you know, kind of sketchy and kind of scary that I laugh about and learn from, uh, looking back on. And so it was, it was like everything. I remember I got into Oman really late at night. And I, I tweeted about this at one point, um, semi recently, but I like didn't plan well. And I got into Oman. I didn't have any cell phone service when I got there. I misread the bus schedule. So like my bus arrived super late, like it was already dark out. Um, I'm basically like getting dropped off at this bus station with a handful of other people and no businesses are open. Uh, they're like, aren't any taxis there for some reason. And the few people around don't really speak English. I have no Wi-Fi, no cell service. And I had an Airbnb booked, but I didn't know like how to get there or if it was one mile away or 20 miles away. <laughs> so thoroughly unprepared, um, lesson learned there. But somebody, the one person I found who spoke good English, I kind of explained my situation and he's just amazing. He was like, dude, you know, come with me. Uh, like if, you know, if it's okay with you, you can, you can come with me and I'm happy to like take you to your Airbnb. I know it's late. You probably haven't had dinner. He like took me to dinner with three of his like friends and two of his family members at this like great restaurant that was open and showed me a wonderful time and then dropped me off my Airbnb, which was not close. Like drove all the way across the city to my Airbnb wow. and would not let me pay anything for it despite my my offerings a couple times because he said visitors are gifts from god and yeah. i was just like damn that's uh you know people are good there's a lot of good out there in the world yeah especially in like other countries and especially i guess where you were uh, hospitality and uh just like love and i don't know like nurture is definitely in in people's nature in other countries and uh, yeah, yeah, I, I've heard other stories that yeah, people will take you like in as their own for that short time, and yeah. it, it's, it's that's very that's a very uh, I, I guess more rare thing in first world developed countries, or maybe maybe, maybe it's a time preference thing, but yeah. uh, ever everywhere else in the world they, they definitely get it. Very much so, yeah. And then I had, you know, at the other end of the spectrum, I had some funny experiences. I, uh, I got chased by motorbike guys in Penang, Malaysia, 
which was got my adrenaline pumping a little bit. I, um, I luckily only, like I had on sneakers and I only traveled with a small backpack. And so I like literally had to run from these guys and I don't know if they were trying to, I don't know if they just wanted like my phone or my backpack or me, <laughs> but I, yeah. I wasn't about to wait around and find out. He's so. a tourist. He's got money. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So I was, uh, I was like sprinting through Penang during, during the day, trying to like get away from these guys and had to hide in a train station for like four hours. And I was scared. Like I knew nothing about the town. So I didn't know if it was safe to even go to the cops. I was like, are they just going to take a cut and then hand me to these guys? So, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, that, that was a learning experience for sure. I bet. So uh, after your sabbatical, you come back to the States yeah came back and I was already, you know, had been bitten by the Bitcoin bug by that point very much. So my heart was in Bitcoin. Um, The experience that I had leading SRE teams wasn't as um, sort of prominent in the industry. Like there weren't a ton of companies that were hiring for that. So I had a tough time breaking into the industry in just like using my existing experience. Um, So I talked to some companies in the Bitcoin realm and then I eventually found a company that had nothing to do with Bitcoin, but they were a fantastic startup called Nirvana Systems, and they were building chips to do artificial intelligence. The founders were brilliant. Um, They were very prescient guys uh, from Qualcomm who kind of saw that AI and deep learning is going to be a huge deal. It's going to change the world, and it's going to be such a big deal that it makes sense not only to do it in software, but to build hardware specifically for it. And like processors- Were you saying chips or chips? Uh, sorry, uh, ch- chips. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, chips. So as in like, um, you know, similar to Bitcoin miners where that was yeah. that progression from like graphics cards, GPUs, and then briefly there were FPGAs, like field programmable gate arrays that were faster than GPUs, but not as fast as ASICs. And so that's kind mm-hmm. of the progression when you have an industry that's deep enough and worthy of enough capital to invest, then uh, eventually it'll kind of, if you want to fully optimize it, then you build out ASICs, just chips that only know how to do those very specific operations and nothing else. Um, And so it ended up being cool context for me because it, you know, I wasn't really a hardware guy, but um, so I was kind of managing their cloud computing infrastructure and their cloud computing team. But, uh, but getting to be exposed to, you know, that stuff, they were building a few layers deeper in the stack helped me understand that industry a lot more like the ASIC manufacturers and, um, you know, where all that happens in the world, um, like Intel and Samsung are two huge players, you know, in, uh, that do that. And then TSMC is probably the biggest, uh, Taiwan semiconductor, So just getting to see behind the curtain of what it takes to both in terms of capital and people to actually produce a processor to do something specific like that. So I don't imagine that's easy. Yeah, it's not easy. Uh, It's capital intensive. So it was very risky to do as a startup strategy, because if you make mistakes when you're designing the chip, then to do like a to fix those errors and take another swing at it is like millions of bucks. So yeah. you got to really like be on, be on your game to get it right the first time, hopefully. Um, so and what's your pitch? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. And, and uh, you know, Nirvana went really well. And it was, uh, I think, two years after the company was founded. Um, it was acquired by Intel for $400 million. So, nice. um, and it was a pretty small shop too. I think I was employee number 20 there or so. And by the time that Intel picked us up, there were maybe... Uh, 35 or 40 employees. And I was definitely the dumbest person in the room in all the conversations. It was like brilliant, (laughs) brilliant people at that company, a ton of intellectual horsepower. And uh, I was very grateful to be able to experience that. Yeah. I know that feeling when going to Socratic seminars and they're just talking about lips and shit, (laughs) like smile and wave, nod, right? maybe. And of course, the more I I go, because I go to the bit devs, with uh uh ben carmen is my roommate so yeah oh nice and uh yeah so him and um our other guy we all drive down there and uh you just kind of like osmose it in over time but uh going to like the difficulty and kind of the 
iffiness about making these chips. What is your pitch to investors to keep investing, even though this is kind of like a risky thing to do and it could fall apart? Is it just layering in the uh, the high risk, high return thing for them? Or what what is like the main thing to sell them on that this is going to be a good investment? And hey, maybe this will be acquired later for a hundred million dollars and whatnot. Yeah. Like, um, like with hardware specifically, I would say that um, just being cognizant of the upfront capital requirements. And like often if you're founding a company that intends to build hardware as part of its strategy, you'll just be asking for a lot of capital early on. Whereas like a software company would be able to scale and reach a lot of people and potentially generate revenue um, with far fewer dollars. Right. And so Um, as an investor, just understanding like, okay, that's why they're asking for a ton of money at this very early stage, even in their first round or two of funding is because they're going to take a swing at someday, maybe building an ASIC, um, like, a, you know, which is the term like a ASIC, um, like application specific integrated circuit. And yeah. those are these processors that only know how to do one thing. And what de-risks it a lot is once the industry has kind of been established, So the very first company to ever build a Bitcoin ASIC, like a Bitcoin miner, that was a super risky investment, you know, and I don't even know who exactly was first to do that. I know there are examples of early companies like Butterfly Labs that uh, have kind of become lore in the Bitcoin community as like, I think they failed to ship a bunch of stuff or it was like horrendously delayed Um, because you just sort of don't know what you don't know about, um, you know, how the the design, whether the design is going to work as you intend, or if your engineers accidentally overlook something in the design of it. Um, So once somebody has successfully built an ASIC, then doing subsequent revisions of it, or kind of optimizing that design to like improve performance is much lower risk. Um, So like, I, I, it would be much riskier to invest in some net new, uh, you know, ASIC to do some kind of computation that isn't, doesn't really have an industry built out around it compared to doing something like an ASIC for deep learning or an ASIC. All right. No worries. Air- AirPods, AirPods die. But, but yeah, no, it, it's, it, it's totally like, um, you know, creating a uh, solution first and finding the problem. Yeah. Um, and so then let's see, after Nirvana was acquired, I spent a year at Intel Um went to, I helped organize some Bitcoin uh, meetups within Intel. They're like a hundred thousand person company. So it's like a, you know, it's basically like a city. Um, And there were some internal like email lists for Bitcoin and that sort of thing. So I was kind of trying to nudge people internally in that direction. Um, Also poked around trying to figure out if they had any interest in like designing chips to mine Bitcoin or anything like that at the, you know, I never got like a super official response on anything, but it was really hard. I got the impression they were not interested in that at all at the time. May have changed Uh, in 2020 and 2021, but uh, yeah, who knows? Uh, Who knows? I'm optimistic that they'll see the value proposition at some point. Um, But then that gave me, that acquisition gave me some capital to start, uh, you know, not only acquiring more Bitcoin, but to do some startup investing, which is something that, I'd been really passionate about, or at least interested in, um, and wanted to try my hand at. And so around that time in 2017 is when I started um, making some of my my, my personal investments into startups in the space. And so what, uh, I don't know how much of this is like too confidential or anything, but like, what were some of the first companies you started looking at? One of the, well, a a good way to start for anyone who's interested in investing into startup companies um, or, you know, doing sort of angel investing, which is where you're investing your, your own personal capital. It's not like through a, through a VC fund or anything like that. Um, Angel.co is a fantastic website and organization because they make that process really easy. Yeah. 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 Naval founded that. Um, Prior to that, it was uh, it was a lot more difficult to mm-hmm. um, like handle even just like the paperwork um, and everything around it. And so they really streamlined that through software. 
And uh, they made it easy for people to go on and start what are called syndicates, which is basically where someone who's well connected in an industry, you know, maybe it's Bitcoin or esports or what have you, they'll go in and they'll start a syndicate and then they're really plugged in. So they know like all the entrepreneurs and the founders and they're seeing who's building what and who's raising money. And then uh, people can sign up to join this syndicate and kind of pool together their capital and be part of an angel investment into a company, but not exactly have to, you know, have access to that deal flow directly or have as much capital as they would be required to have often if they were just doing it solo. Um, so through syndicates, you know, you could write like a $1,000, you can invest like a thousand bucks into a startup and do an angel investment for like a thousand dollars. And so it's a really good way to um, like play some bets, get some skin in the game and just get familiar with all the mechanics of like how it works. Um, and you'll see the process that's involved, the, you get access to the, the documents that are filed. So you see like the paperwork and what that's like. And then as you do more of it, you get more comfortable Then if there are opportunities that do come your way directly, then, you know, hopefully you'll have a much more like a foundation for better evaluating those and understanding what to expect during that process. Yeah. So I recommend people who are interested in that go on angel.co, create an account, sign up for any syndicates that you, that seem uh, like they're in a sector that you're interested in, or they're led by someone who you have confidence in as an investor. And then, uh, yeah, that's a great way to, to start. That's awesome. I mean, it's definitely, <laughs> I, well, I guess Warren Buffett was the first one that coined the idea, like invest in what you know. And it sounds like a very similar learning experience with Bitcoin. Like you buy little and then over time you just, you, it, you blossom in your brain about like what Bitcoin is and why you should keep buying more. But uh, it, it's it's really cool how you, is it as little as a thousand or, you know, you don't need to be a uh, qualified investor of like 250K minimum or anything or like, well, what, what are the, I guess the, the, the wall you needed to break through? Yeah, there, there still is that requirement around being what's called an accredited investor. Thank you. So Thank you, in order to, that's the word. I was yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which by the way, uh, you know, is a super like philosophically, I'm very much against that requirement. Like I hate Same. that that is a requirement, right? Um, yeah. Because that's I, what causes booms and busts and we can't have those because people are too stupid to invest their money. Yeah, I think it's completely hilarious. And, and by hilarious, I kind of mean sad that they will not let people invest into highly scalable early stage startup companies. And the reason behind it is to, you know, protect these people against, oh, yeah. uh, you know, the they might not understand the opportunity or whatever. They don't want people to get scammed, but then they will let them go and buy lottery tickets that are like, right. you know, state run by the government. So I think that's... Uh, that is sad. I hope to see that rule abolished completely, but it has over the years gradually become more accessible due to some subsequent legislation. So I think the requirements um, historically are like, you have to have a million bucks net worth, or you have to have more than $200,000 a year of income salary. And that's just um, to be an accredited investor or are we yep, still talking and about that's just, co? Yeah, that's just to be an accredited investor. So that's to like invest in the startups in general, whether it's through angel.co or somewhere else. Oh, wow. um, that's, yeah, that's like table stakes uh, to begin. There are some ways that it's become more accessible recently through like, um, like the legislation has passed that has made it possible to do like crowdfunding and things like that. Yeah. Um, I can't remember offhand, like the the exact names of that legislation or the parameters for it. But, um, but historically angel investing has been restricted to yeah people with a net worth of a million bucks or an income of 200 K or more, which is ridiculous. Um, but, uh, but yeah, assuming that you are, you know, you can kind of self-certify as an accredited investor, then you can go to angel.co or, you know, just to your own network and look for opportunities. And I think, I think the minimum is a thousand dollars per investment on angel.co, but I'm not certain of that. Uh, but syndicates are really nice because it simplifies things from the startups side too a little bit. Like as a founder, if you're taking funding from people, then it's a lot of overhead, right? Like it's a lot of, you know, 
calls to talk to potential investors and kind of make your pitch, explain what you're doing, uh, you know, get money, like facilitate the transfer of money into the account and then button up all the paperwork around it. And then there's also kind of these maximum amount, like I think depending on what type of business entity the company is, uh, you know, you're only allowed to have a maximum of some like 99 investors or something. And so every one is like a line item syndicate. Now for each like company, like a, like a C corp or an S corp, um, something along those lines. And so syndicates are great because you can have like 50 people all doing, you know, a thousand dollars or $10,000, whatever amount they're comfortable with. And then all 50 of those people on the startups, you know, uh, cap table is the term for it. Like from the startup side, it just looks like one investor. And that investor is like the syndicate. Yeah. But that represents it's like behind the scenes that's that syndicates capital is coming from a bunch of different people. So it's less communication overhead for, uh, for the startup. And that can be really attractive in certain circumstances. Yeah. That's awesome. I mean, essentially it's similar to eBay where like AngelList is just like a marketplace to yeah. bring uh, people together to invest their money and choosing like somewhere to like category of musical instruments or art or whatever uh, you're trying to buy. Like you just like click that category, that's the, the syndicate. And then you just have all these people investing their money. So it's just like yeah. very like, pinpointed. Yep. Aggregate yeah, capital. for sure. Yeah. So I, uh, so I got my start doing uh, syndicated investments through angel.co. I think I did three or four of those and, you know, relatively small checks. And then none of those were Bitcoin companies. Um, those like were like three separate syndicates. You mean? Uh, actually it was all, I think it was all through one syndicate. Um, and it was a fantastic syndicate. Um, I got really kind of lucky with, uh, with the lead for that. It's actually, um, Joey Krug's syndicate, um, from Pantera Capital. Oh, okay, um, cool. Yeah. He ha- yeah, he, uh, he runs a fantastic syndicate. I don't know how active it still is any longer, but, um, you know, he, he like nothing to do with cryptocurrency in any of those investments, but it was like, food tech i'm pretty passionate about nutrition and food too and so i uh i often you know kind of summarize my investing in a tongue-in-cheek way that my favorite investments are ones that fight the two greatest evils in the world sugar and the state nice so i uh, start a uh, carnivore syndicate yeah man there we go (laughs) So, so what like i invested in a food tech company that's kind of trying to help um uh, innovate some food substances to wean people off of sugar addictions. That's um, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, stuff like that. Um, one robotics company, which is an area that I don't know too much about, frankly, but it was just kind of uh, an opportunity that the timing seemed right and it seemed promising. And I was kind of in my learning stage. So like getting my bearings with everything. And then the more comfortable I became, uh, I finally started to reach out into the networks that I was better connected in. And then that one, especially being Bitcoin at the time. And so the first companies that I was able to invest in personally that were not syndicated, um, actually Samurai Wallet was the first Um, Bitcoin related investment that I did back in 2017 and really, you know, still big fan of um, everything that those guys are doing and have done since then. And uh, you know, there's always a bit of spicy drama on social media around like, you know, the coin join stuff and, and all of that. But I think a lot of that is just noise. And at the end of the day, Bitcoin being private is really important to me. Just people having financial privacy. If they they want it for their circumstance and uh and i think samurai has just been fucking crushing it in that realm so yeah uh, absolutely this is your friendly reminder to rate subscribe if you it's say the best things they come in threes like rate subscribe if you if you rate it five stars we can raise a bar subscribe so you can stay in tune Don't forget at the very end to leave a nice review. Something like I love you, Sue. Rate, subscribe, review, please. Thank you. Hey, what's up, guys? Guess what? I wrote a song. It's called ETF and the Fed. It's pretty dope. It's actually playing in the background as we speak. Anyway, I want to remind you guys I'm doing a fundraiser gonna raise funds 
for a full record because if you dug my song there's plenty more where that came from I would love for y'all join the band donate via Bitcoin and some fiat options proceeds are going to not just funding the record but also giving back to the community by working with actual Bitcoin companies and paying them in Bitcoin creating the circular Bitcoin economy and dropping economic earworms of the sound money revolution to the masses. Anyway, go to ETF615.com for more. Until then, rock and roll. So what are the logistics of of that or what is the communication to where, because those Bitcoin companies, they, they're not part of a syndicate, right? So are they just doing like uh a seed round first and you were just looking at them and you found them at the right place, right time. What's the typical relationship between you as an investor and just going to any company if they're not part of a syndicate? Yeah, there will typically be these stages to fundraising that tech companies go through and startups go through. And the terminology is usually like pre-seed first and then seed and then uh, like series A and series B and on down the line, as many mm-hmm. letters as you want to add. It usually and, stops at D and then it goes at messes something and then, and then they go public or something. Right. Uh, I mean, it, going public could in theory kind of happen at any point along the way. Usually that's like a, like a series C or beyond kind of situation if they're going to mm-hmm. IPO. Um, but uh And then they could also be acquired by a larger company at some point. Those are kind of referred to as exits. So if you're an investor and a company that you've invested in has, you know, an exit, and that usually means they either IPO'd, went public, or they, um, they were acquired by a larger company. And those types of events are, you know, liquidity events are when someone who invested earlier might be able to um, you know, kind of realize some gains from that, yeah. like effectively make some money from that investment. But that can take years and it is yeah. a very high risk process. So like anyone thinking about doing this should be realistic about that. It's usually completely illiquid and just like locked up for, you know, say three to 10 years. And, uh, and there's a lot that could happen along the journey of a startup company. And you might never see that money again. So um, just kind of being understanding about that from the get-go is super important. Uh, Most of the investing that I've done and well, really angel investing in general tends to be focused at the pre-seed stage and the seed stage. Because when you get beyond that, then, you know, it's possible to invest individually, certainly, but um, typically the companies are interested in just larger dollar amounts at that point. That's where you get into sort of growth stages. And so um, it's, it's a little bit less attractive from the startup side. It's also less attractive from the investor's side because the potential upside from there is typically not as great. Like you um, might, if you deploy $25,000 or $50,000 into a startup company, like pre-seed very early on, that's obviously a much riskier place to invest because maybe it's just an idea at that point. Maybe they haven't even like built the product yet. And so who knows what could go wrong along the way. Right. But if it does go well, then, you know, maybe it's like a hundred X return, or maybe it's like a thousand X return in some, in some cases. Whereas when you get to those later stages, like the growth stages, then they've already got product market fit. They've already, you know, they're already making money presumably. And, uh, and so it's the path to success has been de-risked a lot. It's a lot more clear, but you're probably not going to get like a 1000 X from that point. Right. So the potential multiple on your investment won't be as high at those later stages. Yeah, definitely. It's the whole buy low, so high thing. And then your risk, your risk is adjusted like over time, depending on how successful the company is or isn't. Yep. Yeah, totally. And also like the angle that I came at all of this from was originally my background was on the engineering side. And I've certainly learned a lot about the VC world and kind of the financial aspect in recent years, but that was not uh, my interest or expertise at first. So I'm not passionate really about like analyzing spreadsheets of revenue and crunching numbers and, you know, kind of looking at those statistics. I think 
where I really have a knack for this stuff is um, gauging founding teams, like, like the team behind the product. Are they, uh, you know, are they the right team? Do they have kind of the right skill set to go and do what they're trying to do? And then just in terms of the idea and the concept, is it something that people are going to love? And is it something that's going to be important and useful for the world? And so that's where picking a sector that you, you know well really comes into play. And for me, that's primarily been Bitcoin. I've probably done 16 or 17 angel investments total over the last few years. And um, most of them, like more than half of those are in Bitcoin. Yeah. Bitcoin companies. And those companies probably, maybe some, but a lot of them probably will not outperform Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah. So. And that's, that's really a funny thing too, to think about is um, once Bitcoin is your unit of account and Bitcoin is the denominator, then uh, it, it changes the game, right? Like, uh, <laughs> do you still invest, you know, into a startup today if you believe that six months from now we're going to like stock to flow our way to $288,000 per Bitcoin? Yeah. Um, you know, maybe. Like, I think the answer to that gets really case by case and nuanced. Uh-huh. Uh huh. I could see like factors that would influence that for me are, is, is this, is my investment really going to move the needle on the company's success? Like maybe if it's some idea that not many people believe in, or they don't have other access to like other sources of capital potentially, then maybe it's some situation where like you or you and a couple other people could really determine whether this idea yeah. gets to, whether we get to take a swing at this at all. And if it seems like an important enough thing that you believe in, then yeah, maybe uh, for those reasons, it makes sense to part with some sats for it, even if you believe Bitcoin will outperform it in the near term. Yeah, definitely. Uh, just going back to what you're saying about like people, it's this is very uh, comparable to Bitcoin because Bitcoin has the brightest minds and engineers working on the protocol. And similar with the company, you you are in you it's human capital like each human is bringing their own skill set so they are themselves an asset and maybe just some capital from you and your buddies is all that needs to kickstart them but if the idea is amazing and the people are amazing then it doesn't really need that much you would think if the idea itself is gonna blossom be innovative and appreciate it kind of takes care of itself but of course like people need money to start somewhere but it also goes into people re-evaluating their investments and you know, Bitcoin Tina goes on about this and that mm -hmm. it won't be as much of a debt economy. People won't be taking out loans to invest in these projects. People will actually look at their stack and be like, how many of these stats am I willing to part with? And this is essentially, I guess, what cleans up malinvestment that we have in a fiat economy. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Um, I couldn't agree more. And I think eventually all this whole industry will be forced to, you know, adopt Bitcoin and to measure its success against Bitcoin. So that's one way that I see the future of venture capital having to adapt is like Bitcoin is going to have to become the denominator. As more people think in terms of Bitcoin and Bitcoin becomes global money, then it, it becomes less and less meaningful whether some startup investment outperforms dollars because Bitcoin is going to be the money. And so there will be emphasis throughout the industry on like, can this opportunity outperform Bitcoin? And maybe in the early days, like right, right now, um, and yeah. I think we're still early, like maybe right now it's really tough to outperform Bitcoin still. And hopefully that's true. I think, it, I think it is really tough to outperform Bitcoin, but as you know, once we get to like a ten trillion dollar market cap, then it becomes gradually easier to outperform Bitcoin. As you know, the, the sort of global value of the money starts to um, plateau, yeah, so to speak. So, j just riff on that for me, if you will. Where, what kind of specifics do you see happening? I don't know how much thought you've put into this, but you know, what where does it kind of start? What kind of, uh, I guess what are the details in any of this? Like, have you thought that, that uh, far forward? Uh, like, where do you place your, yourself with that as well? 
like with um like with bitcoin's impact on the vc world specifically yeah the like the whole world. transition yeah. and and it's mm-hmm. funny i'll take it back to nadav because you know i a few months ago i just binged through all of his podcasts because they're like a minute long or whatever but yeah. like he brought the idea of like you know angel.co and everything as an alternative to equities anywhere else or any other like hard asset you know because just i guess over saturation and like loss of value and so the whole vc thing seemed like the alternative and then you know bitcoin does seem like the alternative of, of vc so maybe we're being a bit, bit redundant but specifically what do you think the steps are in that transition i yeah i i think i i agree with your assessment there that um people because the money we've had has been bad right um you know the value of the dollar degrades gradually, it pushes people increasingly towards riskier and riskier asset classes and riskier and riskier investments just to kind of keep up. And so like that is broken. And all of the financial gymnastics that the average person has to do nowadays just to keep up are ridiculous. Like I don't think like a dentist and a carpenter or, you know, a painter or computer programmer should in an ideal world based on sound money, just be able to focus on their craft and be as good as they can be at it, add value to society and hold money and the money's good. And they should be able to have a fantastic life, you know, and certainly be self-sufficient just through that. You mean money should not... do what it was supposed to do? Right. Exactly, man. Right. So mind blowing idea. That's nice when my money works. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> but because that's not been the case, it's like, okay, well, now everybody has to start buying bonds to keep up. And then suddenly, um, you know, you can't keep up doing that anymore. And so you have to buy like public stocks. And then suddenly it's like, do we get to this point where at some point you you can't even keep up that way and you have to do this high growth, even riskier angel investing? So that I think is an insidious trend that I look forward to Bitcoin absolutely crushing. I think people shouldn't have to do this type of investing just to keep up or to like make more money, they should do it if they want to do it and they feel like they're good at doing it. And they they feel like they're good at like evaluating these opportunities and doing this specific type of maybe venture investing or angel investing, whatever it is. Um, So uh, that I think is just kind of a big theme of this transition is Bitcoin will let people focus more on what they want to do and what their core competency is. And then just allow them to protect the value they get um, better from doing that. Uh, in terms of how it'll change, you know, the landscape of the VC world, I do think a lot about that often. There's, I think, some hedge funds out there are already doing a good job of being early adopters in terms of measuring results against Bitcoin. I think through the Meester's at a, uh, what was it, Adamant Capital, I believe. Um, yeah was measuring returns against Bitcoin. I think they wound that, that shop down, but, um, but you know, there's like already some funds out there that are trying to do this, trying to measure returns against Bitcoin. And that's commendable because that is like hedge fund on hard mode. <laughs> you know, it's very, it's very uh, tempting to kind of- Take notes, Ray Dalio. Ign- ignore, yeah, yeah. Uh, Which he you know, is, think, to his credit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think like the Ray Dalios of the world, like Bridgewater, um, Jason Calacanis with his whole investment syndicate, I always, you know, I kind of get up in his mentions and his replies on Twitter sometime like, hey, when is your syndicate going to measure its returns against Bitcoin? Because I do, like, I think that's the future. You've got to, it sounds crazy now, and it would be very much like an early adopter thing for them to do right now. But eventually, I think that's inevitable. You'll have to measure your returns against the money. Bitcoin's going to be the money. Um, There's also a lot of secondary effects that could be really interesting in that, um, a lot of the mechanics of how startup investing works today is just based around where you incorporate the business, like what jurisdiction, um, you know, what legal paperwork you file under it. And in some cases, you might not even need that stuff as much at all going forward. Um, it may be possible to raise money without the company having a bank account. And maybe you keep all of the company's funds in Bitcoin yeah. and, As a result of that, like maybe even in kind of uh, extreme cases, you don't even know the identities of the people who are building the company. 
that would require certain, like there's a lot to that in terms of how do you establish trust? How do you make sure it's not like a, like a scam and a cash grab and they're going to vanish overnight. But in some case where maybe you can build up a reputation and credibility under a pseudonym and show promising, you know, that you're working on a promising project and it could have some kind of investment grade returns, then maybe you don't need to ever have a legal entity or reveal your identity to your investors. And you can just kind of give them returns back in Bitcoin. And it, it's interesting, like it, it sounds crazy now, but I think that Bitcoin being unstoppable money could also lead to unstoppable companies because you remove that requirement for identity and traditional financial infrastructure and all of that stuff that's very easy, those choke points that are easy to use to stop um, or to regulate. Yeah, it would seem that the emerging economies of the world would really be the the blueprint kind of grounds to start establishing that because, you know, those people are unbanked. I mean, you know, the leaders and, you know, people that have money there aren't obviously, but, you know, that's green new ground to actually build financial infrastructure. So whether that's yeah. El Salvador or whoever, it, and be, because people are just so, so already connected, like they are in, in the U.S. Everyone has a bank account, everyone has a credit score, everyone has uh, SSN. Then uh, it's even worse in, in China, where your life is like in an app. So totally, it only makes sense that it would start in like some L- LDC somewhere. Yep, yep. And actually, to to riff a little bit more on it. Um, maybe like a, like a good footnote to it is uh, I like personally, I'm very interested in trying to make Bitcoin more socially resilient. I think it already is by far the most socially resist resilient cryptocurrency or like that's what sets it apart from a bunch of shit coins. Right. It's like, yeah. we don't know who Satoshi was. There's no single point of social vulnerability. We can't blackmail or, you know, like, coerce or bribe Satoshi to try to influence protocol development. And that's good. But when I see stuff happening in the ecosystem, like Craig Wright trying to use the legal system and do a bunch of nonsense to harass core developers or people in the ecosystem, it does kind of, you know, it it highlights that there are some social vulnerabilities in, in terms of at least two Bitcoiners to some good Bitcoiners. So I think one thing that would be great is to see more pseudonymous projects in the ecosystem and even more pseudonymous core development at the protocol level. And that would, I think it'd have a lot of benefits. It would make sure that ideas and like pull requests or BIPs are really gauged more on just their merit. Like what is the, you know, what is the code and less about who's doing it. Um, And it would also just make it harder for bad actors to target certain individuals. And so if there's anyone listening who is, uh, you know, who has a project or a startup or whatever, and you're interested in doing it like completely pseudonymously, then it's probably difficult to get access to capital. But, um, but like I personally would be very interested in something like that. So if anyone within earshot uh, is doing something like that, I would love if you reach out and I'd be very interested in helping however I can. Yeah, that, that would also be awesome. It, it seems like there's a lot of technical barriers to actually, you know, maintain that pseudonymous persona. But I mean, people that are already working on this probably, you know, route everything, SSH and beyond. So they probably have that unlock already. Yeah. And also shout out to uh, like Matt O'Dell and the team at OpenSats with what they're doing because I yeah. think they're, inter- I mean, they're facilitating donations for a lot of good work in the Bitcoin space in many ways. And I think they're also very supportive of the, the notion of encouraging pseudonymous um, contributions and projects and all of that. So that's just another fantastic uh, potential you know, route for, for funding to come in through. Yeah. I love that. I mean, it's just like a a busker on the street. Like anyone should be able to put some cash in their guitar case and just walk away and no one needs to know or care who who gave you that money. It's like, I don't know, but it's mine. So back off. (laughs) Why do you care? Yep. Yep. I think everybody having control over their savings and how they spend is super important. 
a lot of the world's, the worst evils in the world today, I am convinced, are enabled primarily by the fact that people don't really have control of their money. Yeah. I mean, I kind of, I mean, I believe that I probably said that many times, but it all goes back to pe- people don't really have choice, but th- their choice is really, it stems from their their monetary choice, like how they execute any decision is based on how free their money is. Yeah, totally. One of my favorite mental exercises to do is to tally up the amount that the U S spends on wars or just military campaigns around the world. Yeah. And then actually consider how much of that would be feasible if they really had to have people hand over money for it. If the people could actually feel how much they're paying for this stuff, yeah. then there is no way in hell that those would actually happen. The government simply would not be able to get access to enough capital to fund those wars, but because they're able to quietly in roundabout ways, take money from people without those people even knowing because they hide it through all this like complex jargon um, that I think that just enables a lot of evil in the world. I don't think if people realize that they paid 60 grand per household for, you know, the, the war in Iraq, like whether you support the war or not, that's just like a lot of money for a household and everybody paid it. Or I, I think the war on terror has been six trillion. I'm not sure which one, but yeah. yeah and, and people, there's a video out there, uh, like a visual diagram, like comparing like skyscrapers, how much a trillion dollars actually is. And I think the bills are in like uh, like hundred dollar like units, and it takes up like an entire like metropolitan area. Like it's ridiculous, and that's yeah. just one trillion. Yep. And now we're just making it rain trillions, which yeah. is quite ominous. Yeah, it's um, it, it really just depends on enough people waking up and realizing this is wrong and what that really means and losing faith in the dollar because that's the only reason any other empire collapse is because people just had it with it. I don't know the specifics of like, what was the day uh, before and after like an empire fell? Because it just is like a gradual like transition where no one kind of wakes up under in like a hyperinflated uh, state. And then the next day they're starting over. Right. Yeah. So I, yeah. I think it's just really interesting. Um, maybe because we are witnessing bitcoin monetize uh if we do like see that like black and white flip or if it is gradually then suddenly and that's just something that i i do think about and i and i think about like because i believe in the intransigent 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 whatever the minority of people where it doesn't need to take a ton of people to actually make change but you know how large does that minority of people need to be to realize that bitcoin's really the end all be all and when does that happen yeah yeah i agree with you so much on the intransigent minority and i like Corey clipston's article that he wrote a lot about yeah, that good. through the bitcoin context for sure um yeah i'm also reading when money dies now which wow. is you know a great book about the uh, hyperinflation in germany in the i've 1920s. been scared <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm not finished with it yet, but even so far, it's, uh, it's, it's great just to get an idea of what it was like for people actually living through that. And they have these really eye-opening anecdotes from like journal entries from citizens in Germany back in those days. And th- I think it's so hard to r- realize what's happening when it's a change in the measuring stick, right? Because like money and the German mark in their case was the measuring stick that they used to conceptualize value. It was their unit of account. And so that's what everything is kind of relative to, right? And that's what dollars are for us in the US today. And so when they would see that, oh, like the US dollar is becoming more valuable, they always framed it in like, there would be journal entries from butchers, you know, over there and they would be like, well, that's weird. Like the dollar is rising in value a lot. 
And what's th- what's really happening is the mark is falling. Yeah. But it's it hard. From, to, like yeah. the amount of notes. I I read a little piece in Bitcoin magazine and I uh there's some numbers in there from uh, the hard money you can't fuck with is an amazing book. And I kind of relied oh, yeah. on that in, in writing this piece, but it was like the amount of marks that were in circulation was somewhere in like the billions. And then by the time it fell, it was in like 140 quintillion or something stupid. Yeah. And the they, uh, you can't yeah. outprint the dollar. And I mean, the only thing war is good for is printing money. And the only thing that printing money is good for if your nation state is war but i mean you you're forced to uh like debt is used as a weapon against you if you're going against like a global hegemon like the u.s and so you're basically forced to fold your cards and bleed yourself to bankruptcy totally and they can play that game for a while too is the frustrating part when, yeah. especially when you have reserve currency status as the U S dollar does today, then that it, like it, it's just the base of so much monetary activity worldwide that it takes a lot longer for, um, for, you know, hyperinflation to occur or for it to get to that kind of escape velocity. So uh, compared to if it were just the sovereign currency of a much smaller nation, you know. Um, And so there have been people like gold bugs, even before Bitcoin exists, who were kind of shouting about, uh, you know, um, going around doing their chicken little thing saying, Oh, the sky is falling. Uh, the dollar is about to hyperinflate so far. They've been wrong. And objectively speaking, like that has not occurred yet. Yeah. Um, but I think they're, that's they're just, just so good of... at hiding it, whether it be through Euro dollars or whatever shadow banking scheme, but yeah. that's starting to turn around. I mean, China's selling treasuries, Russia a couple of weeks ago announced like one of their central banking people said that they're completely de-dollarizing their assets and said that cryptocurrency is a viable option or i forget whatever the quote was i mentioned that in in my piece too but i guess i kind of answered my own question in that you know they're part of the loud minority that Mm -hmm. are desperate to find some alternative but again the u.s has just been so strategic and great like it's not just them i mean they depend on saudi arabia to you know they depend on the entire rest of the world to settle in dollars and then supposedly Saudi Arabia is supposed to funnel their money back into U.S. treasuries to prop up petrodollar. But again, like how long does, does that really last? But it could go on for much longer because they've been so damn good at it up to this point, sort of. So that yeah. kind of gets me a little depressed of like, you know, do I get to see hyper Bitcoinization in my lifetime before I die? But it's it's really weird because like no one knows. And even people that I guess are pointing the strings, they don't really know because they're also living vicariously and looking at their options and like what what else do we have here? And I guess that turns into like a CBDC or something. But still, like they're they're new to the shit, too. Like they, they don't know what they're doing. Totally. Yeah. And for anybody listening who's curious about just more of this subject, I think Alex Gladstein's petrodollar writings are spot on. Fantastic material. Um, But yeah, understanding that dynamic of like, where does the value from the dollar really stem from? That's a deep rabbit hole and connect a lot of dots there. It gets to some gnarly stuff. I mean, essentially it's coercion. Like again, the removal of choice. Yeah. And historically, when leaders have loudly proclaimed that they are (laughs) taking anti-dollar moves, it has not worked out well for them. It did not work out well for Saddam Hussein or Gaddafi. And uh, and so I think that's an unfortunate dynamic, but I'm optimistic that the unique attributes of Bitcoin make it such that it will kind of permeate uh, like it's unstoppable uh it's yeah. far harder to stop than other alternatives we've historically had access to such as gold it's going to be very interesting with the whole el salvador, el salvador legal tender thing and the imf basically having no choice but to accept it and the more countries that do this and don't need to depend on the 
the IMF and World Bank, it's basically like a big middle finger to them because, I mean, yeah. the World Bank and IMF have not been helpful. Like that's basically how these countries become owned by the corporatocracy or essentially U.S. or private corporations. And so, unfortunately, if anyone's read the new Confessions of an Economic Camp Man, that's essentially how, how the game goes where private infrastructure from the U.S., is uh, funded by the World Bank and IMF because those countries need to take out loans. And if the leaders of those countries don't, you know, put up and shut up, then they're essentially like kicked out of an airplane or, you know, a coup happens. And so I'm uh, cautiously optimistic of, you know, how this starts to, to play out. And I don't really know how Bitcoin makes people safer other than like it's not confiscatable unless it's like, you know, by the point of a gun or something, but still, you know, you're not taking that person's Bitcoin unless if you have their seed. So it's, it's just really going to be uh, something that very interesting to pay attention to, to see how this plays out. Like, I, I don't know if you've really thought this far into it, but how do these other countries prosper? How do you, how do they get away with it? How, how do they remain safe and prosperous as they grow their economies with Bitcoin. I think right now we're at a really, really critical point where the first big nation state actor uh, being El Salvador in this case has taken action, right? And they've kind of stepped up. And what I am hopeful will happen very soon is others will follow suit. Because I think if it's, you know, if we get like five plus countries, um, even if they're all in like Central America, Latin America, um, that just makes the whole nation state adoption game theory, a lot more resilient at that level, um, strength in numbers, so to speak. And so I'm hopeful that over the, the next three months, we'll see, you know, one or two other announcements. Maybe it's Paraguay, who knows, they seem to be indicating that they've got some stuff brewing in terms of legislation to that end. So that would be super cool to see. Yeah. But, uh, but when it comes to Bitcoin and nation state adoption and, you know, how that plays out. I think, as you mentioned, it, a lot of it comes back to Bitcoin being unconfiscatable. That is just such a huge difference relative to what we've had historically, right? With even gold. Um, you know, it's kind of dark to think about, but gold is very vulnerable to pillage, like literally, you know, you could like firebomb a town and like from airplanes and then go in afterwards and just find all the valuable stuff and run away with that value. And you can't do that with Bitcoin. Um, or you could just like, you know, use violence and either throw somebody in a cage or like shoot them or what have you. And then you could go and you could take the stuff that they have. And I think we underappreciate how different Bitcoin is in that regard. Like, sure, you could do horrible stuff to a Bitcoiner if you captured them and maybe coerce them into giving up their private keys. But that, even the act of doing that, is a whole costly, unpleasant process that uh, is expensive and unwieldy to do at scale. Like, if you wanted to do that, you know, globally or within some nation to, like, go after a bunch of Bitcoiners, that's, like, hard to do at all. Um, certainly hard to do successfully. And so I think... A lot of people will get really hung up on, oh, you know, it's still like they could still coerce you into handing over your private keys. And like in theory, sure, that could happen. It will happen in some instances. But it's so expensive to do that compared to all the other alternatives that it changes the it lowers the return on investment for violence of the nation state. And that that is such a game changer. Yeah, they, Reese Moog and the other dude when they wrote the sovereign yeah. individual, like man, they were so forward thinking. Hundred percent. Yeah, that's one of my favorite books for sure. Yeah. Well, I, I guess we kind of wrapped it up on a happy note there, then, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's, now it's all everybody can just cheerfully go go about their day. Yeah, hey, go buy Bitcoin. It's um, be day. But but I I will kind of um you know I'll. I'll add uh, some uh, a more cheerful note to end on in that, like, I think there's a whole range of paths that Bitcoin's global adoption could take. And I, I believe Bitcoin's the future, you know, world's money, right? But it's all about like, what does the path look like to get there? 
And sure, there are some dark dystopian violent paths as we just alluded to, um, but hopefully it's not that. Like, I think if we play our cards right and we work for and believe in this peaceful, prosperous upgrade path where we kind of all hold hands and upgrade to better money together with like, you know, more senators and more Congress people, uh, you know, advocating for this and maybe nation states embrace this gradually. And it is sort of this peaceful upgrade process. I think that's totally possible. So I, the tack I try to take is work for that peaceful, awesome upgrade, but just be cognizant of and kind of prepare yourself for the, the less good upgrade. And that's what it's all about. Hope for the best, prepare for the worst. How are you? Take it a little dark again. Sorry. How are you preparing yourself? What would you recommend? I think knowing, yeah, knowing the risks of, you know, KYC, um, be, just being cognizant of, uh, you know, your, your Bitcoin, like who knows that you have Bitcoin or, uh, you know, how are you protecting your Bitcoin and what lists are you on? What info? Yeah, neither do I. Um, it'd be nice to have some, maybe someday I'll aspire yeah. to that. <laughs> but like, what lists are you on? What information about you is out there and who could access that information at a very basic level? I think a lot of it stems from that. And um, I don't, there are some people who are like, KYC is completely evil and, you know, nobody should ever use any KYC company ever. And I think that's a little bit extreme. Like, if I could wave a magic wand, I would certainly eliminate all KYC regulation, 100%. But I think given that it exists, um, you know, user-friendly KYC on-ramps are important. Like I totally recommend people get started that way because it's a lot of hoops to jump through and a lot of other trade-offs and risks to acquire non-KYC Bitcoin. It's a lot of friction there. And so if we didn't have those user-friendly KYC on-ramps, I think we just wouldn't have Bitcoin adopted soon enough and we wouldn't get to this better global money as quickly as we would otherwise. Um, but it's yep. just like, be careful as an individual in these systems, just be cognizant always about what info you're putting out there and to whom. It is a good point that you bring up because when my buddy, when I was paying in Bitcoin last week, I made him download Blue and Moon Wallet and we're like, all right, we're gonna have you hold your own keys. And he had to KYC for Cash App and he didn't go through it because it was just like abrupt. And but, you know, there was that stare of like, what the fuck is this? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, dude, that's why Bitcoin's different and it's important because with Bitcoin, you are your own Cash App. And totally. like it might suck, but for a lot of normies and noobs out there, they kind of need that wake up call because once they're like, isn't that my money like over there? Like I can see it. <laughs> and uh, they just they just need they need that wake up call. They that's how you realize something's wrong, like something yep. is fundamentally broken here. And uh, yeah, these barriers might suck, but it kind of might be the first barrier that people need and that will spark their curiosity for their, go down the rabbit hole. 100%. It lets them get a taste of this stuff. It lets them experience a little bit of number go up or a little bit of uncensorable, more private payment, whatever it is. Yeah. Cool. Okay. I think that was a nice enough note to end on. <laughs> <laughs> I think so too. That, that was a good place. Very balanced. <laughs> oh, oh, like well, one last question. So we tried to organize this a few months back and you're like, oh, I'm just kind of taking a break. I hit the podcast circuit, whatever. Is there anything oh, yeah. uh, new that you're working on that you want to get out and, and shill any new exciting projects or? What an excellent question. Um, new exciting projects. Uh, I am excited to see a lot more capital become available in, in Bitcoin. Like, uh, there's now Trammel Venture Partners, TVP is- Yeah, Christopher. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, they're, they're solid. I've been working with them as an advisor um, recently. And so it's really cool to see founders and entrepreneurs who are building in a Bitcoin native way and they're not shitcoining around, have access to you know capital at a larger scale than just kind of precede angel individual stuff because historically huge, that was a big challenge for the industry huge hat tip to that man for helping be so instrumental in getting the whole bitcoin mining thing passed in texas 
Oh yeah, for sure. Um, I, I think they are doing a good job. That's increasing my, you know, uh, FOMO of not living in Texas is seeing all of the, Everyone's not only here, man. Bitcoin, yeah, I know not only individuals who are doing awesome things, but just at the state level, everything that like Christopher and Joe from uh, Joe Kelly from Unchained Capital have been, uh, helping happen there has been amazing to see. Yeah. So, so that's cool stuff. Um, no, I would say projects that I'm stoked on, uh, Impervious is yes. a badass company that I think is still underhyped. And I like what they're doing a lot. They're building a layer on top of Lightning. So it's effectively like, you know, Lightning is a layer two. Impervious's platform is going to be a layer three on yeah. the Bitcoin stack. And I kind of think about it as they are doing for Lightning kind of like what Twilio did for Voice. If you're familiar with Twilio as a, as a company, they... Um, like they made it possible for people to write scripts or write little applications to automate stuff with the phone system um, without having to know all the gory details of like that protocol and like, you know, the, the phone carriers and all the, those details, they hide all that complexity. And I remember I used to write scripts uh, to like automate some on-call stuff at the companies I worked for using Twilio. And I didn't really have to know shit about all the, the messy details of like how, how the phone systems and those protocols and vo voice over IP worked because Twilio just hid all of that and made it really simple to build apps. Yeah. And so I kind of see what Impervious is doing as, uh, you know, roughly analogous and they're making it easy to build applications that get that run on lightning and get the benefits of lightning in terms of like security uncensorability, um, all of that. Uh, but people don't have to know or be exposed to quite as much of the, the protocol complexity if they were building directly on Lightning. Yeah, abstracting away the gory details and the code to just make it easier to build new things on the new internet, essentially. Yeah, for sure. So I'm excited to uh, to see what they do. They gave a great little presentation um, in Miami too that I think is up on YouTube now. So anybody who's not familiar can kind of check that out to get the gist of what they're up to. But um, but yeah, other uh, other than that, I've got some writings in the work. I'm hoping to write more because I haven't really. I've tweeted a lot in the last couple of years, but I haven't done as much. Um, you know, long form deep writing. And I used to do a lot of that early in my career and I kind of miss it. So it's tough to get back into the habit of just allocating time. But, uh, but me saying this out loud right now is going to help hold me accountable to actually <laughs> right. actually put some stuff out there pretty soon. Yeah. I've actually done that on other podcasts and saying, oh yeah, this is going to be a three part series. So I'm like, shit, well, got to hold me accountable. <laughs> Guess like it's got to be now. Yep. Yeah. It's all about managing time and uh with that steven i really appreciate your time i think this was a stellar conversation uh looking forward to putting it out and looking forward to meeting back up at bit block boom but dude this was awesome so thank you so much hey man uh, i appreciate you having me we'll definitely see you at bit block boom in dallas stoked for that and uh and yeah happy to chat anytime man love it yeah.